Now we're going to talk trash, literally. Um, <laughs> and that's an area where I think there's a great opportunity for Swedish-American commerce. Uh, someone said, Steve's all about numbers. And in a way, I am. So again, I have some numbers. As a nation, the United States generates more waste than any other country in the world. 4.6 pounds per person per day, to be exact. The corresponding number for Sweden is 1.3 pounds. If you add it up, the difference between our two countries is 1,205 pounds of waste per person per year. That's more than half a metric ton per person. What's the Swedish secret? Well, uh, rec uh, recycling is one. We've heard that today 99% of all household waste in the Stockholm is recycled. The, uh, equivalent number in uh, New York City is 17 percent. Uh, but it gets worse because you've got to truck this stuff to landfills, so the uh, resulting pollution from the diesel trucks we have here in the city, uh, they drive 7.8 million miles every year with trash. And these cars, as you may have known, those of you who live here, they're not of the latest model. Uh, the distance well, it's equivalent of 312 times around the Earth. And uh, not to mention sewage. As someone said to me, Steve, uh, we live in the city and we think it's totally natural to take an elevator 40 floors up into our luxury condo, go to the bathroom and flush and forget about it. The uh, sad truth is that Manhattan's sewage system, the majority of it, uh, was built in the 1930s. And when it rains in New York City, it doesn't take a lot for raw sewage to bypass the treatment plants and flow directly into the city's waterways. All it takes is 1 20th of an inch for this to trigger of extra rainfall above the normal, so to speak. 1 20th of an inch, that's to us metric people, 1.3 millimeters. And this is not just a New York problem. The exact same problem exists and has been identified in 711 other US cities. Overflows whenever there is a little extra rainfall. But let's leave this crap, if you pardon my French, and uh, <laughs> listen to three people who actually have some solutions to offer. So let me introduce, not in the way they're sitting, but the way I wrote it. <laughs> Gunnar Tillin of Ecobalans, who is this year's winner of the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce in New York Deloitte Green Award. And Paul Toretta over there. If you looked in the program, uh, he doesn't look anything like the woman in the program. <laughs> that woman happens to be his daughter and his partner and a very, very recent mother. So dad and partner is filling in. And, uh, Finally, Christa Edemark of Envac of Sweden. Uh, as we've said before, you read their eminent bios and we get straight to the point. And uh, I've given all of them a very limited time to actually tell us what they do and what the key solutions are. Then I'll get back to questions. I'll hand the mic out to you for questions. And they know that they have been tasked not only by Michael Wood, but also by me to what is your one great idea in the field of waste? So, with no further ado, Gunnar, Ecobalance. Thank you. So, where I get the, the clicker? It's over there? Okay. I do believe it's over there. <laughs> this is supposed to be the one. That's All right. The, um, Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Swedish American Chamber of Commerce, for, for uh, inviting me here, and uh, great to be here. Uh, sustainable nutrient recycling, this is what Ecobalance is about. Uh, we develop technologies to refine nutrient-rich residues into high-quality fertilizer. Okay, there are several nutrients, there are several technologies, but as ordered by Ambassador Wood, I will limit myself today and speak only about phosphorus. Phosphorus is critical. Uh, the world's food production is dependent on this. It's a non-renewable element that we mine in phosphate mines. 
and numerous scientists speak of shortages in the future. The phosphorus is not substitutable. We can't, you know, if we run out of phosphorus, we can't replace it with anything else. So uh, shortage in the mine, less uh, easily accessible phosphorus will mean higher food prices and eventually food shortage. So recycling is the key here, right? Okay, now we have a lot of uh, rest product, residues with phosphorus in them. So what's the problem? We can you just, you know, recycle that directly? Well, it's contaminated. Together with the phosphorus in there, we have heavy metals, pathogens, etc. A little bit depending on, on the substrate quality. But it's always some, some kind of contaminants in there. And it's a lot of water, 70 to 98 percent, depending on if you, if, you, if you have the water in it or not. That's a lot of truckloads going around with a lot of water. Not really sustainable. In, in, in sustainable agri agriculture, what do we want? We, would, we don't want any, any pollutants on our fields. We want concentrated nutrients. And we want to improve soil fertility. So it's not only the nutrients, also the organic material. So how do we get there using this stuff? OK? This is, I'm showing you now the EcoBalance uh, um, suggestion on how to do this. We start out with the sludge, household waste, manure, etc., and put it into a digester and make biogas. We don't do that. CH4 does it. A lot of other companies does it. Very good. Clean, renewable energy. And out of the digester, after the biogas has been produced, comes digestate. We can dewater it and get the solid phase and liquid phase. This is done already, and the solid liquid phase you can spread on the soil. However, this is just the first step. We have developed technology that, so to take out phosphorus from the liquid phase as a struvite. That's magnesium ammonium phosphate with a concentration of phosphorus about the same as in the phosphate mines. High concentrated pure phosphorus. A lot less uh, heavy metals in that than in the phosphate that we dig up in mines. Okay, so that's from the liquid phase. And then from the solid phase, we can, through a drying and pyrolysis process, produce a biochar with the rest of the phosphorus. 20 to 60 percent of the phosphorus you can get, get in the struvite and the rest in the biochar. So, altogether, with the struvite extraction and the pyrolysis, more than 99 percent of the res residue phosphorus can be recycled free from contaminants. And another beauty of this is that at the same time, this will actually reduce handling costs at the treatment plants. And you get the, pho the phosphorus as a bonus. What do we do with the extracted struvite? Well, we can mix it with the recycled nitrogen and make a fertilizer that looks like and can be treated just exactly as an ordinary or artificial fertilizer, but without the contaminants. That's EcoBalance. Thank you. Thank you, Good. Uh, my name is Chris Rodemark, and I'm the CEO and president of uh, MBAC. We are the largest uh, clean tech company in Sweden. We are 50 years old, so uh, it's, this is a matured um, uh, product we have, which we invented 50 years ago, and now we are coming to the United States. Uh, we are, uh, as you see on the map, with all our own companies in all over Europe, in Middle East, in um, Asia, in many countries. We are in Toronto, uh, in uh, Montreal, in Canada, and now we are coming to uh, New York. And the reason for this is because of this project, Hudson Yards. Uh, I learned yesterday from the people there that this is actually the largest real estate project in the history of America, which is under construction right now here in New York. And we, in July, signed the contract to deliver our technology into this project. Uh, but if we look on the... Uh, Waste collection systems in, in, in New York, you can see that some hundred years ago it was uh, horse carriages, and then you got trucks, and that's where you are still. You are with trucks. This is 100-year-old um, technology. Now we bring you the new technology, the 24, uh, 21st century technology into New York. And because this is how it looks in New York, these are 
pictures, which you probably see in the evenings, in the mornings, uh, waiting for trash, uh, trash uh, tracks to, to pick up. Actually, we, we, we installed one system here in 1974 in Roosevelt Island. That was a pilot project. It's still running. And one of the in interest, interesting things are that it was the only collection of waste during the Sandy uh, and also during the 2011 winter storms. Our systems work all the time. Uh, the system is quite easy. It works like a huge uh, vacuum cleaner. And I will not, it takes a long time to go through this in detail. But it's a utility, it's an infrastructure. We, bu we build a, a network of piping in the streets, connect the, the, the buildings to this, and we transport the, 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 air, the, the, the waste by air and vacuum. And uh, it's fully automatic. It's working 365 days a week, 24 hours, fully computerized, and no, no people addressing that. We can take up to 15,000 apartments in one system with a radius of two kilometers or a little more than a mile. And we can have multiple uh, waste streams. In uh, Hudson Yards, we will have three streams, recyclables, trash, and organic. Uh, of course, this is not new. We started in Sweden. We have in Sweden, in Stockholm, all, all the, 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 the projects you saw when Stockholm City was presenting, they are all equipped with our systems. We are in Hammarby Sjöstad. We are in Se Royal Seaport, which is the first smart city development in Northern Europe. And we also, uh, uh, in Stockholm, we had the first automatic litter bin systems for parks, where we collect the, the trash automatically from all the parks, nice, nice and clean. And you can see this is just outside Grand Hotel uh, with, a, with a castle behind, uh, which was installed by the city of Stockholm just a few months ago. Barcelona was the first city in the world to integrate our technology as basic infrastructure, a utility, same as water, electricity, and so on. And of course, that's our vision, and that's our big uh, idea, to introduce this also to, United, to, to, uh, to uh, New York, that you can build an infrastructure. To have one project like Hudson Yards will not change the, the setup for New York. It, it will be good for the people living there. But in order to get to, uh, to, to, to have some impact, you need to do this from the government. And of course, this is done in London, uh, Paris. This is the only large project built in Paris right now with our system, Clichy Batignol, which should have been the, the Olympic Village if, if uh, Paris has got it. And I learned yesterday that uh, Hudson George should also have been the, the Olympic Village if. Uh, New York had got the Olympics in 2012. We are in the Middle East. Of course, there is a lot of uh, development in the Middle East. High class uh, in, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi. In, uh, we are building in uh, Mecca, in Riyadh. A complete new small Manhattan is, is under construction in Riyadh. As you can see on the picture, we built the Pearl of Qatar uh, in Dua. We are, build, we are building in Brazil, in Sao Paulo with Odebrecht. We are building uh, the first smart city in India, uh, which is promoted by the, by the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, in Gujarat. He was the governor there before. Uh, of course, we have been in China for 10 years. We are building projects in Beijing. The new Tangshu new town is a new financial district in Beijing, built with our systems. Uh, the first eco city in China is built also with our system. Guangzhou was our first large project, 150,000 people for systems in, in Guangzhou. Uh, Singapore, which is also respected as a very sustainable city, we have 80, 80 projects there. And now the, 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 now the local authority has also started to introduce our system as districts for the, for the, for the, for the government projects. Uh, South Korea is our largest single market. We have more than 500,000 apartments in Korea. And the new capital in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, is 100% with our technology. It's uh, about 100 kilometers south of Seoul. So this is a matured, reliable solution 
It's uh, working all over the world. It's a true sustainable solution. It takes away the waste trucks. It takes away the waste bins. It's uh, fully, use, uh, fully automatic and reduce all the heavy work for the, for the truck drivers and so on. And improves living on standard and takes away all the waste for the rats and the birds and the, all, the, all, all the problems. You, you, this also creates in a, in a big city. Thank you. Paul. But makes it go. Just this one. That one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, Paul Tretter, uh, CEO of uh, CH4 Biogas. You know, if we get through this quickly. Um, okay, we design, build, and own uh, biodigesters. Uh, I realize one of the previous speakers said that you know his process comes after a digester. Uh, we build those digesters. We built 45 throughout the world. Uh, there's two running in the United States. We convert organic waste to high value renewable energy products. Uh, we reduce landfill, uh, reduce landfilling, we reduce CO2 emissions, we reduce odors, and we uh, put the nutrient rich soil back on the land. So actually we're a recycling business. The waste comes in, it's organic waste from food processors. We take the uh, waste, we digest it, we pasteurize it and digest it. And then we put the soil, the discharge back on the land. Uh, we reduce disposal costs. We move food from the food chain that wasn't uh, to be uh, used. For example, this winter we had the uh, Arctic freeze. Here's one of our, our uh, facilities. We had the Arctic freeze. There was 4,000 tons of cans that were stuck in Atlanta. And we took 4,000 tons of cans into our facility in uh, Napoleon, Ohio, and disposed of them. We recycle the cans, we recycle the boxes. It's a complete recycling business. We don't have any discharge from our facility uh, that's not used either through fertilizer or through uh, can recycling or through cardboard recycling. We have these, Campbell's is uh, one of our bigger projects. It's in uh, Napoleon, Ohio, that's the, the business. It's a simple tank. We pasteurize, we digest it in that tank, we make gas. That gas is used to run engines. We provide Campbell's power and heat for 20 years behind, behind uh, the meter. So we actually provide them direct power. We have one running in New York where we take yogurt waste to a big part of sustainability in New York. We take uh, probably 100 tons a day of yogurt waste. And here we take 300 tons a day. So we, we process based on manure and everything, about 600 tons of waste in these two facilities every day. Um, we're a complete mixed digester. We don't have a lot of problems with that. Independently verified through the state of New York Cornell University we've worked with. Uh, we're also approved by the USDA to take meat wastes. Uh, we have odor control, gas cleaning. We run the whole thing on, on a computer control, which I can control from my office. I have computers that look up these systems. I bring them up online. Uh, it's been 45 plants throughout the world, and it's uh, very mature. We don't have one plant that's not working. Uh, so we accept a wide variety of wastes. Uh, you know, our customers are, well, the big soup cans, but we also have ConAgra, uh, Walmarts, Wegmans. Uh, we don't take Whole Foods. I don't know there's a previous speaker. Uh, we haven't <laughs> haven't approached them yet, but we take most of the big suppliers. When the organic waste is removed from a shelf in a store, we get the organic waste. We grind it up and put it in the digester. Uh, this is where, this is soup plant. This is where we sit right adjacent to their site. Uh, that's what the facility looks like. It's all stainless steel. Um, we operate two in the United States. We've got three or four under, under uh, contract we're working on right now. Uh, this, is the, this is where we are. I'm in Greenwich, Connecticut. That's where the office is. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Is that quick enough? Thank you, Paul. Now, uh, what you three guys do, particularly our friends who handle solid waste, uh, you're still just scraping the surface of the earth, right? Uh, I saw a study by the World Bank 
done in 2012, which says that uh, this waste problem that we're facing today is going to be bigger than the climate change problem. And uh, the problem is that the countries with the biggest problem are the ones with the lowest budgets and the least money. Uh, what do we do? An international invention? Put it in the United Nations? Uh, what about that uh, Texas-sized uh, big plastic island sp <laughs> spinning around in the Pacific? Tell me. Please, Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, the first step is to, to, to have an another mindset. We, we talk about waste. Actually, it's resources. Uh, already, the, the term um, uh, landfill mining is on, on, the, on the schedule, you know? Uh, mi uh, minerals, metals that are, you know, rare earth metals that you can find there, mine them in, in the landfill. That's one part. Uh, another part that I, I usually mention is that if you take uh, sludge and you put it uh, in the landfill, that is the future phosphate mine because the concentration of phosph phosphorus will be high enough in the future for that to be very economically uh, acceptable to, to, to mine. So it's waste in one word, resources, really. Okay. I Please. mean, uh, you said th these two problems are actually, actually connected because one of the largest polluter on, on CO2 and CO4 emissions are landfill gas. Uh, actually, 3.5% 3, 3 of all the, uh, all the emissions in the world is coming from landfills which is uh, more than 50% more than all the aircrafts in the world. Yeah. So this is a really, and uh, so the, the organic food put on landfill is the biggest problem we have. And it's not recyclables, it's not uh, the trash it itself, it, it is the organic, which we have to separate already from the beginning in the, in the kitchen. Otherwise it will not be used. Uh, and to recycle and use it as a resource. To, uh, to make energy or to make uh, fertilizer or, or to make compost or whatever is possible with the financials they, the each country have. Because this is, as you say, the, the biggest polluter in the world are the, the, the developing countries, except for the United States, which is yep. a developed country but has one of the highest landfill rates in the world. So I think uh, in that respect, uh, United States is far behind Europe. And why is that? The, the main reason why we have come so far in, in Europe and in some other countries is because of legislation and because of, of taxes. This market is not driven by the market itself. It can only be driven by taxes and leg legislation, which we have done in Sweden, and that's why we have come to 0.5% oh, landfill. Yeah. It's banned to have, landf to have landfill on organic in Sweden. It's banned to have waste in the streets in Sweden. It's by law. And Paul, do you agree that uh, well, legislation yes, would Canada be a way just, to go? Canada just passed a law that there's no more organics in landfill. So Massachusetts has that same law. Rhode Island has that same law. Connecticut has that same law. It's being passed in New York State. So the landfill uh, disposal of organics is becoming really really difficult for the United States. But the problem with the United States is, and it's not a problem in Europe, is yours paying 12, 16 cents for a kilowatt hour, we're paying four cents. Mm -hmm. We have $4 gas, you don't have $4 gas. No. It's really hard to compete when you have $4 gas and four, and four or five cent power to put up a $16 million biodigester. Mm -hmm. You just can't afford to do it. I mean, you'd have to have a company like Campbell or General Mills who we work with every day uh, they want to do it, they want to be sustainable, they're willing to sign a long-term contract at some rate that's reasonable. Let me ask you a biogas question. I saw that uh, three years ago the largest landfill in Mexico City, the Borgo Poriente, was closed and now that one emits about 20 to 25 percent of the greenhouse gases out of Mexico City. And uh, they're saying that uh, they're going to recapture this uh, to create power to uh, give power to 35,000 homes. Do you believe in that? Uh, yes. Because, you do? Well, 30 I was skeptical. That's why I'm uh, asking. You can't, we, landfill gas is a big business in the United States. So we do a lot of landfill gas. We make a lot of power from landfill gas. Uh, and Mexico just passed a law this summer, maybe August or 
they signed, that's why I'm working in, in Mexico, but they, they just signed a law saying that private companies could put up uh, assets to make power. They never had that law, and they just signed it this summer. Now they're writing the legislation around it, and once they write the legislation around it, uh, companies will come in and build power plants, but before it was a controlled one, one utility. The whole country was one utility. Now they're allowing private companies to build. So Mexico is changing too. Yeah. All the countries are changing. And, yeah, I, th uh, this is, you know, this is just a, a way to do it, a, a poor way to do it, you know? Yeah. Landfill gas, it sounds, sounds good to produce power for 35,000 homes. Okay, what if they collected the organics yeah. to begin with and made biogas from it in a controlled way, much more biogas, much more energy, and recycled nutrients. Yeah. Yep. It can yeah, be done, we've done it already. Your point that uh, we should uh, change our view on waste and actually view it as a resource. Oh, yeah. I read that uh, we have 32 waste to energy plants in Sweden, but we don't have waste enough to keep them burning. So we buy waste from England among other countries. Is this? That, that's not correct. Oh. Because right. uh, you never buy waste for incineration, but we take the, w w we are paid to take the waste from oh. some, yeah, because we it's a negative value in, in waste. Uh, even so, it's and, and, and that's why they, they produce electricity, they produce uh, hot water for the district heating, and then they get also uh, a ga gate fee. Uh, and so, so it, 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 we get a lot of waste from, uh, from, from Norway, especially, and, and sometimes from, from uh, South Europe also. But uh, that's not the future. But uh, but we are so good now in recycling. So we have overcapacity in in uh, in our in, in, our, uh, in our incinerators. Finally, uh, what's the biggest obstacle, very shortly, that you meet in the business you're in? What what do you have to overcome? Is it a mindset? Is it legislation? Is it a money issue? Uh, is the technology not there? What's the biggest issue? I'll say I'll start with you, Paul. Uh, I think it's the uh, legislation. We don't have, we don't have a green tariff. We, the United States does not have a green tariff. So if you go to sell power, you don't get anything more than making green power. And it costs a lot more to make green power. So I think if, if you had a green tariff or if there was some way the government could do something with that. Uh, but since we're, the, our country is not cohesive. So every state has its own rights. Every power company controls its own area. It's hard to put a, a broad legislation in place for this country. Nick? Legislation uh, as well for, for me, uh, also in Sweden actually, uh, although we, we pride ourselves in you know, recycling, we, we don't recycle much of the phosphorus, actu actually, m much less than we could. And the Swedish government have, have put up a very visionary goal for, for recycling of phosphorus in, in, in sludge. Uh, but uh, they, they are yet to also uh, come along with the legislation that really promotes this. So uh, we're waiting for that. Yeah. Christo? Uh, I would say two things. Uh, first of all, conservatism in, in the waste management business. Uh, and, and the second is uh, short term, looking not, not looking at this as a, as a way to create um, uh, resources and business and um, I I invest in infrastructure. So if, if you only look for a couple of quarters yep. ahead, you never invest in infrastructure. And that's our biggest problem. So uh, to round it up, very shortly, your one great idea to give to well, I Michael mean, Wood? I think that, you know, change the legislation in the country to have green power would be my, my takeaway from here. We can recycle the phosphorus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And push and it down and down the ground, right? And, and I just saw that there is a lot of empty space underneath <laughs> New York. So why not use that to, to travel our, our waste in New York instead look, of the streets? I'm looking at the ticker here, and we have time for two questions in my estimation. Anyone want to talk trash? Yes? Um, I uh, finished graduate school about ten months ago and I did two research projects on food waste and composting and anaerobic versus aerobic digestion. Uh, but one of the things that kept coming up in my research is 
how you convince people to source their food waste. There's a lot of um, negativity around sourcing food waste from the, the rest of our, our other waste. So, I mean, what's the best way? How do we encourage people, get people involved to, it's saying it's okay to source our food waste. There's, there's no negativity uh, around it. They're you know, worried about smell and you know, other, other things. Short answers. I would say that the most important thing is information. Uh, no, no recycling schemes or whatever, if it's food waste or, or plastic or whatever, it has to be launched by massive information, uh, how, how it works and how the, 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 the materials coming out are used and, and recycled. Thank so you. people know that. I, I can just agree with that. Uh, the problem is collection. So it's again back to the trucks running all around the United States. If you have small amounts of waste that's uh, at everybody's house, the collection problem probably is more economically harmful than the, the disposal problem. So we basically work with the large suppliers, you know, Wendy's, Wegmans, Walmart, you know, Kellogg, you know, Nestle. They separate their waste at need, and they have enough waste that the collection problem isn't a problem. So except for maybe in Manhattan where you have really good density where the collection problem is less of a problem. In most of the communities in the United States, if you go out of Manhattan or out of LA or out of Chicago, collection is the, is the problem. So thank you. And uh, the ticker is down to zero. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.